Welcome to Thursfield's Talk Legal, a vidcast series from one of the leading law firms in the Midlands. I am Steve Dyson, a journalist who's talking to a range of solicitors at Thursfield's on legal topics of wide interest to the public or businesses. Today's episode is called Do You Know Your Consumer Rights? And joining me online to discuss this is Simon Hocking, a senior associate solicitor in the commercial litigation department here at Thursfield's. Hello to you, Simon. Hello, Steve, and thank you very much for inviting me. Simon, we're here to talk about consumer rights, which sounds like a massive subject area. To narrow this down a bit, what does it mean when a contract says your statutory rights are unaffected? And what are those statutory consumer rights? So the statutory consumer rights uh, are simply your rights under a wide range of legislation um, when you enter into a consumer contract. And what it's reminding you when it says that is that although you might have rights in the contract itself, for example, you might have a warranty uh, under which your goods might be repaired or replaced if they're defective, um, you still have those underlying consumer rights. And importantly, those rights may, may be as good, if not better, than the rights that you're getting under the contract. So it's simply reminding you of that. Um, and as you say, Steve, uh, consumer law um, is complex. Um, there is a lot of, of legislation that applies when you enter into a consumer contract. Uh, but perhaps the, uh, the most important uh, for consumers is the Consumer Contracts Regulations 2013. Um, those regulations uh, do, do have set out some important rights. Uh, so firstly, uh, they say that when you enter into a consumer contract, you're meant to be provided with certain information about the, the goods or services that you're purchasing. So, uh, for example, uh, you're meant to be told the main characteristics of those goods. Um, but you're also meant to be told about uh, a right to cancel. And that right to cancel can exist where you enter into that contract um, in a position where you're not at the trader's premises. So you're not in the shop, you're not on their premises, and you're entering into the contract. So that can be online, uh, via the telephone, but somewhere other than the trader's premises. Where you do that, then you have a right to cancel the contract. And normally that's a period of 14 days that you have to, to cancel. But if the trader hasn't given you written notification of your right to cancel, and assuming you have one, then you actually get a period of 12 months to cancel the contract instead of the usual 14. Uh, so that, that, that's a that's very important um, part of consumer legislation. Uh, the second piece of legislation that I think is, is important is the Consumer Rights Act 2015. Now, firstly, I think it's important to, to recognise where that applies and where it doesn't. So under the Act, there's a, there's a dividing line, if you like, between people who enter into a contract for professional or business purposes. So that might be, for example, an architect or a shop owner. Uh, now, they are traders. Uh, and also people who enter into contracts uh, for reasons other than professional or business purposes, and they are consumers. So importantly, the Act only applies to contracts between traders and consumers. It doesn't apply uh, business to business contracts between two traders, for example, or between two consumers. So it wouldn't apply if you entered into some sort of contract with your neighbour and you weren't entering into it for a sort of professional business purpose. So it only applies to traders and consumers. Um, under the Act, uh, it, it, you have various rights and they you get those rights through terms that are imposed into the contract by the Act. Um, so, for example, in terms of goods, you the Act imposes terms into your contract with a trader requiring those goods to be of satisfactory quality. In terms of services, there is a similar provision which uh, is implied into contracts, which requires the services that you to be provided under the contract to be carried out with reasonable care and skill. Um, so those basic standards apply to both goods and services. Um, there's also a similar provisions related to digital content, requiring that digital content to be, for example, of, of satisfactory quality. That sounds clear. Uh, what about delivery, Simon? So uh, the Consumer Rights Act says that if you don't agree a date for delivery of goods, for example, then the trader has to deliver those goods without undue delay. 
uh, but in any event, within 30 days of, of the contract coming to being. Um, so if the trader fails to deliver either by the agreed date or by that 30 day uh, deadline, then you can specify uh, a date, provided it's reasonable to the trader for the goods or services to be delivered. Um, and if the trader doesn't comply with those dates, then in certain circumstances, you have a right to cancel the contract completely uh, and get a, a full refund. So in fact, unless it's agreed otherwise, there is a, a term implied by the Act that the trader has to deliver the goods. So uh, if you've, you've not discussed that with the trader or you haven't agreed that with them, in fact, there will be a term that the trader has to be the one who delivers the goods. And if they are to be the one who delivers the goods, they are responsible for those goods until they are delivered. So if anything happens to the goods, they get lost or, or they are damaged in some way, then it's the, the trader's responsibility, not the consumer's. And delivery under the Act actually requires the goods to be handed into the physical possession of the consumer. So what that means is if the consumer, for example, has ticked the box and said to the trader, I want these goods delivered to my neighbour, number 17, for example, um, and the courier arrives, knocks on the door at number 17 and doesn't get an answer, and they therefore go around to another neighbour, number 13, uh, and give the goods to them, then that means actually the goods haven't been delivered. They've not been given into the physical possession of the consumer. Um, and that's also the case, for example, it can be the case where goods are left outside the doorstep of a front door or left in an open porch even, um, that can be, uh, that cannot, might not constitute delivery of the goods under the Consumer Rights Act. Um, and that's obviously important when it comes to um, situations where the goods uh, either go missing or are damaged in some way. Uh, so under those circumstances, the traders would remain responsible for the goods. Loads of consumer rights you're discussing there, Simon, and they're really interesting. Um, but who gives those rights to the consumer? Who owes them? So it's it's the trader that you enter into the contract agreement with. Uh, importantly, it's not the manufacturer of the goods. And this can be important, for example, with uh, complicated uh, electronic goods, uh, for example, mobile phones. Uh, in those situations, often manufacturers do offer uh, consumers the ability to go into uh, the manufacturer's store, for example, uh, and get a repair replacement of the item. But it's important to realise that it's not the manufacturer who owes consumer rights under the contract, it's the person you enter into the contract with, because these are terms of the contract that are implied by the Act. Um, so it, it may be that if, for example, the manufacturer uh, would give you a, a replacement device and that device itself was defective, um, you'd still have the ability to go um, to the seller of the device uh, and enforce your consumer rights. What happens, Simon, if something goes wrong? How can you exercise your consumer rights? So the Consumer Rights Act gives you a number of options that you could choose from. Uh, these options are in addition to, not instead of, uh, your, all your normal options, for example, to bring a, a claim simply for damages. Uh, so what the Consumer Rights Act says in relation to goods is that you have the, uh, the right, uh, depending on uh, when you uh, exercise that right, you have the right to a repair or replacement of the item in question. That's only if it's economical to repair, but if it is, then you have the right to, to request that. Um, in respect of services, if the services are performed effectively, you have the right to repeat performance of those services. So you can ask, so for, in, for example, in relation to a builder who builds a wall, if the wall is wonky or defective in some way, you can ask the builder to come in and redo that and, and reinstall the wall, if you like, uh, to make sure that it's it's not defective. Um, and if they uh, refuse, of course, if, if the, um, the trader refuses the uh, the repair or replacement, um, or if the builder refuses to rebuild the wall, you can bring a, a claim for damages in the usual way. And in the same way, in respect of delivery, if, as I've mentioned previously, if the uh, trader doesn't deliver the goods either by uh, an agreed date 
or by the 30 day deadline imposed by the Act. Um, you can simply request a, a reasonable delivery date. You can specify, look, I want it delivered by this date. Um, and if they fail to deliver it by that date, you can simply cancel the contract in certain circumstances and get a full refund. In many ways, this sounds encouraging, Simon. But if the supplier of the goods or services isn't playing ball, what's the best course of action for the consumer? Um, so uh, much depends on the, the value uh, of the, the contract in question. In uh, contracts where the value is worth £10,000 or less, uh, you can bring a, a county court claim. And the procedure for this is, is fairly straightforward. Um, it involves preparing paperwork that set out uh, the details of the contract and that set out what's gone wrong with the goods or the services. Um, you send that to the court. The court will then stamp that um, and send it out to the trader. The trader will have a certain period of time to respond, uh, either by admitting the claim or defending it and setting out why. And then if they defend the claim, um, you will have to fill in a bit more paperwork. And then there'll be a, a trial at which the court will decide whether they accept your version of the story or whether they accept the defendant's version. Um, so it's, it's a fairly straightforward procedure and it, it involves relatively modest costs. But the important thing to recognise in those kind of proceedings is that there is a limit in terms of how, how much solicitor's fees you can recover. And at the moment, that's in the region of around £100 to £130. Um, so it's not very much money. And that can have a bearing on whether uh, it's economical for you to instruct a solicitor. That's useful guidance for those smaller issues in the small claims court. But what about bigger cases over and above £10,000? How are they pursued, Simon? In a very similar way. Um, so with claims worth £25,000 and under, uh, they would normally be uh, dealt with using what's called the fast track procedure. And in that procedure, uh, there are certainly a lot more rules that apply to small claims. Um, but it's a question of, uh, again, preparing your paperwork, sending it to the court, you send it to the defendant. Uh, the defendant will then, or the trader, will, will set out whether they want to admit the claim or defend it. And if they defend it, uh, again, there's, there's more rules that apply. But effectively, you have to exchange um, uh evidence, uh, witness statements and documents by dates set by the court, uh, and then there will be a, a trial. And in fast track claims, that trial is limited to just one day. So that necessarily does impact on the amount of evidence that you, you get uh, to be able to support your case. Um, but in fast track claims, you can recover the majority of your costs, generally between around 60 and 70%. There's no hard and fast rule on that. Um, but you'll be able to recover most of your solicitor's fees if you are successful. Uh, with claims worth more than £25,000, this is dealt with by the multi-track procedure. Uh, there's no limits on the trial, so you can um, obtain more evidence than you might have under a fast-track case to support your case. Um, and there are also more rules uh, that you need to comply with. So one of the big differences, for example, is right at the early stages of the case, um, once you've, you've found out whether the trader is going to defend the case or not, there will be what's called a CCMC hearing, a cost and case management hearing, where the court tries to get a grip with what evidence is going to be needed to uh, support or defend the case, and also um, understand what sort of level of costs that will be incurred by both parties and try to um, ensure that those costs are not too high. One of the important things to realise in both in fast track and multi-track claims is that you may be ordered to pay your opponent's costs if you're unsuccessful. That's not the case with small claims. If you're unsuccessful with a small claim, then generally, unless you behave unreasonably, um, the court won't order you to pay your opponent's costs. But in fast-track and multi-track claims, if you are unsuccessful, if you lose your case, there is a risk that you might have to pay the other side's costs. So that needs to be certainly borne in mind. It's interesting to hear those three basic routes, small claims, fast track and multi-track. But progressing a claim sounds quite complex, especially for those larger issues. I guess that's when consumers need the advice or services of a solicitor. Oh, definitely. And I think uh, we encounter so many instances where people are not used to bringing claims, uh, don't comply with some sort of fairly minor rule, it might seem, uh, and end up 
suffering quite a significant loss as a result. So, for example, getting the name of the trader right on your paperwork that you send to the court can be really important uh, because if you don't quite get it right, the court can decide that you've not issued the case against the right person and you could end up losing the issue fee, which could be several hundred, several thousands um, of pounds, uh, depending on the value of the case. So in addition, um, it may be that with, with documents, um, you may be ordered to provide documents to your opponent by serving them on, on your opponents. And it may be your opponent doesn't accept email service. We certainly see situations where people email documents to an opponent thinking that's sufficient. And actually, because the opponent doesn't accept email service, um, it's not, it's defective, they haven't complied with the rules, and it can be that they suffer quite significantly adverse consequences as a result. They could, it could, for example, cost them quite a, a lot of money in terms of paying the other side's costs. So um, I think in those kind of cases, it's really important to get professional legal advice. Simon Hocking, a senior associate solicitor in the commercial litigation department here at Thursfields. Many thanks for joining us on Thursfields Talk Legal. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Hopefully what Simon had to say about do you know your consumer rights is something people will find useful. Anyone wanted to know more about consumer rights or who wants help with a particular issue can contact Simon via 0345 2073 728 or by emailing him direct at shocking, that's S-H-O-C-K-I-N-G, shocking at firstfields.co.uk. We'll be back soon to talk to more legal experts here at Thursfields about other interesting aspects of the legal world. Thursfields Talk Legal. Thanks for listening.